So I apologize, it's just me again. Um, and if you got bored in the first one, you will probably leave on this one. Because I don't think I have images in this talk. There's not one. Maybe, two, maybe, maybe a few plots with scattered plots, and that's it. So I, you know, I apologize, I have time. If you want to leave, you're free to, you're free to do it. Um, but uh, what I want to talk about is uh, at the end of the last talk, I refer to the mixing problem, uh, to the nonlinear mixing problem, as a difficult problem where, because of lack of ground truth, and because of um, when we try, when we're trying to figure out the structure, the nonlinearity structure of the data, that's where we have to um, kind of constrain ourselves uh, to smaller, uh, to more controlled examples. We, you know, if we consider just a general data set in which there is intimate mixing, so there's nonlinearity at the microscopic level on top of nonlinearity at the macroscopic level on top of uh, atmospheric uh, uh, disturbances and all these things, we will be, you know, we will be able to, um, you know, apply whatever algorithm, but the interpretability of the results will not be very easy. And so, yeah, you can find, uh, um, you know, performance indices and stuff like this. But what I'm really interested in as a scientist, um, you know, the first talk was a little more like an engineer, but I'm interested as a scientist to really understand the, the, the radiative, radiative transfer properties of mixtures. I want to know really what the interaction between particles um, is and how I can predict it with models, um, especially because I'm interested in um, retrieving the composition of, uh, of uh, uh, the ground pl for planets, Mars, the Moon, and uh, other, uh, other planets. So here I am talking about some toy examples, some laboratory examples in which I somehow simulate in a mixing phenomenon, I take some powders and I put them together um, in a sample, right? And I try to simulate a situation that can then be later extrapolated to a um, hyperspectral image, okay? So it's a control example in which there's no atmosphere. All there is to it is a linear, it's nonlinear intimate mixing. And I want to understand the reflectance that gets that I can measure from these samples, okay? I will start studying the physics, observing the physics of the phenomenon. Hopefully I won't bore you too much with the detail. I will just, I just wanna let you know that this problem is not just a, you know, a playing with data. It's actually a phenomenon that has uh, some science behind it. And that's the first thing that I wanna convey. Second, I will interpret this problem in two different ways. The mixing of this data set I will um, explore with a statistical method that tries to explore the semantic features. Remember those, those uh, uh, minima? We talk about the semantic features in spectra. And another one that's totally geometrical, which explores instead the nonlinearity structure of those clouds. So you've been warned. So. Why do I care? Because I care about intimate mixing. Intimate mixing in the atmospheres of exoplanets to, ex to you know, figure out the composition of exoplanets. Um, there is a whole research that tries to directly detect exoplanets from spectroscopic data. They're in its infancy, right? Right now, you probably know how the exoplanets are detected you know, via an indirect photometric model, not directly with imaging uh, or <coughs> spectroscopically, only a few has been, uh, have been uh, um, seen that way. I care about the surface of Mars. I care about figuring out how the moon was formed. And so that's why I, 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 I need to understand the intim intimate mixing problem. So I want to interpret this very physical problem as in two ways that are complementary. Um, one, statistically, 
with a model that takes into account how real spectra vary. In particular, I'm talking about minerals, because that's what I generally work on. Um, so how the, sem the sig spectral signature of those minerals can be encoded by a, a, an algorithm which is statistical. Second one, if I consider these mixture points as points in a high dimensional space, can I study the, the structure of that cloud with a, some kind of a manifold learning approach? Who has never s um, heard of a manifold learning approach? Because I don't have a slide on manifold learning, so like a general one. I'll try to uh, come up with explanation. OK. The most important thing is here. You have to learn English if you don't know it. I'm sure you're all good, so, but you have to practice it. And I've been told you're smart. And you know applied mathematics. That's a no-brainer. You have to go and spread the knowledge. So, you know, if you're interested in, uh, you know, coming, even for a short while, I invite you to um, send me an email, okay? I'm always eager to uh, communicate with, with bright students, okay? So, um, a mixing on planetary surfaces is really what we're talking about. So more than Earth-based, there's no buildings here, there's no trees, so no, you know, uh, I wouldn't say obvious, but no straightforward feature, spatial features here, like, you know, invariance with respect to geometric transformation or things like that. There's no such thing on Mars. It's all, it all looks the same, very similar spectra, all covered by dust, which is the same composition. It's, it's, a, it's a complicated problem. Plus, you don't know if you know the, really know the right answer. So, uh, so what I'm doing, I'm, I'm kind of constraining my problem into a, more sim a simpler problem. A simpler problem, as I told you, where you, in the lab, you simulate a regolith by putting some mixtures together. Take powders of the minerals that you expect to be on Mars, mix them up, shake it, put it in, in a cup, and image it or um, use a spectrometer on it. Okay? So, the way I am actually um, simulating this is by considering a sample in which there are multiple mixtures, okay? So imagine that you have one mineral here and there is a sprinkle of dust on top of it. That's another material. That's a mixture of these two. Over there, there's another material, but there's the same dust on top of it. It's a very frequent um, thing on Mars, okay? So now, now think about it, if you can think about these clouds, right? The two clouds will come together because these two mixtures have one end member in common, which is the dust, okay? If you have several of these, you can see how, you can probably visualize these clouds as what we call, what we, we call, I don't know if it's the right way to call them, adjoining manifolds. So clouds, they come together some, somehow, okay? So right now, um, so whenever you have mixtures that have shared end members, you have this geometrical structure, okay? So these are the type of structure that I wanna, that I wanna do. But before I do that, let me um, talk about these mixtures from a physical point of view. Intimate mixing is, you know, all of these different um, materials have intimate mixing. Even when you make a, paint, a painting, you, you intimately mix your pigments with your binders, okay? All of these are intimate mixing problem. Most of what you see is intimately mixed if it's a powder type, okay? So, and we have already described the problem of multiple, um, multiple scattering, okay? Um, it, that happens in the, in the immune mixing. The, 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 the effect is that the brightness or in general the energy that um, comes from um, a sample, right? It's a nonlinear combination of the energy that gets um, scattered by uh, different materials. And this is what we already, 
So there is not a direct relation, linear relationship um, like in the linear model between the reflectances of the M members. In, we have now a nonlinear function. Um, so what scientists came up with was a, um, some physical quantities in which now the mixing is linear. It turns out that if you model the, sca the multiple scattering between particles, and, and the first thing that you model is, for each particle, you model the probability, um, or, or, or let's call it a single scattering albedo, the probability of scattering the first scattering divided by the extinction, which is just the energy that um, the particle removes from the impinging uh, radiation, which is both scattering and absorption, that quantity, right, if you calculate it for different uh, particles of different materials, that actually mixed linearly. And that's the first, what we call the first reflection. There is another part in the multiple scattering, which is volume scattering, which is the internal uh, scattering within a particle, and the multiple bounces between particles. That part is the nonlinear part. Okay, so what, what some people were able to do, I'm not going to go into the physics because this is not the venue, but the idea is that if you can model the multiple scatter, uh, the, the scattering as a mixture of single scattering albedo, which are these quantities, and those can be represented by linear functions. That's how the M members mix into a mixed single scattering albedo linearly. Okay? Because they represent only the first reflection. Right? All of the other bounces are not considered. Okay? That's linear. Then you can create a nonlinear function on top of that that has all the nonlinear junk in it. Okay? So they can model the multiple scattering uh, phenomenon as first a linear mixing in single scattering albedo space and then a nonlinear function on top of it. That's the two, you know, the two seconds radiative transfer um, approach. And uh, actually, Hapke, which is the, the guy that came up with this, found an analytical function that did exactly that. It relates the reflectance x of each point, of each mixture, with the single scattering albedo w up there, with some other parameters, which are the physical parameters of the mixtures. Okay. For example, these mu zero and mu are the observation angles. If my sample has, um, you know, imagine that the sample is here. This is the incidence angle, the incidence ray. This is the, uh, the, the reflector ray, right? This angle with respect to the normal, between the normal and the emitted, the emitted ray, it's called the emission angle. The incidence angle is the angle between the normal to the sample and the um, impinging radiation. That geometry is one of the, the parameters of your observation. Okay? So that function says that if, even if the, uh, the, the, the same amount of radiation is, is scattered by the, the surface of those particles, depending on the, ang the angle, so the single scattering albedo is the same, depending on the observation angle, you will have a different reflectance. And you can see it, right? You can see yourself, putting yourself different places will make you see an object with different nuances sometimes, okay? The more diffused the, the radiation is, if, if an object is very um, rough surface, you will see that the, 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 the object scatters radiation in every direction the same. So even if you change yourself, it doesn't change too much. But most objects have some preferential direction. Okay? Some objects, they don't even have diffuse scattering. They have specular reflection. A mirror, water, right? There's glare, right? Glare is a basically specular reflection of so that means that all the, and the, this guy is reflecting a lot of energy just in this direction if these two are in the same plane, okay? So this function, P of G, it's 
um, where G is the angle between the two ray, two, the two planes, the plane of observation, the planes of, um, of uh, uh, emission, um, incidence, that, that function describes how, um, how an object is scattering, uh, how differently an object is scattering in different directions. B of G is another te uh, term that actually um, we'll, we'll ignore, but it's basically, um, it says that when you, in, s in some cases, when you are with low, very low um, face angle, it means that the, these two rays are very close to each other. You get some backscatter radiation, more backscatter radiation for several reasons, okay? Shadow, um, shadow hiding and other, and other um, techniques uh, and other reasons, okay? So, so the idea is that this function relates you to the angles of observation, the, the, the single scanning albedo, and you, we will see other physical properties of the M members, okay? That's the physics of it. And generally we use an approximation where you know, don't worry about the actual function. The idea is that this is a nonlinear function of the single scattering albedo, where this W is the single scattering albedo of the mixture. We're saying that the reflectance of the mixture is a nonlinear function of the single scattering albedo. And the angles. Now, here's where in single scattering albedo instead, the, there is a linear mixture, see? The, mix, the single scattering albedo of the mixture is actually a linear combination of the single scattering albedo of the M members. And this abundance, if you will, is related to the physical property of the material. The density, the grain size, the size of the grains, and how much material you put in weight. So this represents actually an, a cross, um, an, an aerial, uh, abundance, like we did in the, in the linear mixing, okay? It's basically a representation of how much area of the surface is covered by this material. Even if this is a volumetric thing, okay? It's a cross, it actually has the dimension of an area, um, okay? So this is what, where the physical models beat machine learning every time, because this is knowledge that makes your algorithms less biased. This is actually what happens in, in the physics of the phenomenon, okay? So now you see right away what I was saying, right? There is, if I consider my N members as in single scattering albedo, there is a simplex here. These guys sum to one by definition, right? So there is a simplex here and then on top of the simplex, there is a feature space transformation, which is this function. See, you're starting to see the geometry of this problem. So, but let's stop one second. We'll see this problem geometrically when we, when we go here. But now, the way I want to um, solve this problem is by considering um, them from a statistical point of view. I want to emphasize that these spectra are actually, um, they have, the, the spectra have diagnostic features that tell you uh, not only each spectrum what the dominant mineralogy, what the dominant composition is, but they should, if I was able to, re, re, to um, relate the features of the mixed spectrum with the features of the M members, I should be able to do some kind of an, a mixing using this information. And so the key point, of the first part is, can we find an algorithm that encodes the diagnostic information, all those little minima, without knowing that they're there, but just using a bunch of data and, extract, and, and a feature extraction algorithm? Can we really extract the semantic information that would be used by scientists to say, this is mineral A, this is mineral B? And then, can I use this information to uh, a mix. Let's do it. So again, 
these are spec different spectra that, that represent different minerals. And again, those minima that represent different um, bonds in the, in the mo molecules, right? Uh, they, those are the diagnostic information. Well, there is a simple, um, you know, if you will, signal processing interpretation of this. All the squiggly lines are basically discontinuity of the signal, right? What is an, a, a signal, proce signal processing approach that encodes discontinuity in a signal? I heard it. Somebody said it. Wavelets. Wavelets. So if basically what I can do, I can take sp spectral decomposition, like wavelet decomposition of the signals. What does this wavelet decomposition do? It basically encodes the, disc the discontinuity of the signal at each scale. You know, this absorption feature is probably composed of discontinuities at different scales. There is a sharp discontinuity which probably exists at every scale. There is a larger part that probably only exists at coarser scales. So you can see how you can use wavelets. I hope you know about wavelets. I will say something about it. Um, to encode that, those discontinuities that way. So let's, let's see if we can do it. We actually use continuous wavelets. And co what is a continuous wavelet? It's basically a convolution with a mother wavelet that we scale, stretch, and compress, and shift, you know, put an offset on, to have a scale offset representation of the discontinuities of the time frequency, uh, what we call the time frequency um, decomposition of the signal. So with respect to Fourier, right, it's not just the frequency content of the signal, but it's the content, the, uh, if you will, the frequency content at a certain, um, at a certain uh, offset, around a certain offset, and at different scales, okay? So if I apply the, the wavelength decomposition, what I get, I'm not going to go into detail why continuous versus discrete, is that we need an overcomplete. We really need um, to represent our features uh, wavelength by wavelength, okay? Our offset in, in our case are wavelengths, right? Um, and in fact, this is, that's, the, that's a spectrum, and this is the wavelength, the wavelength decomposition. On top, there's the, um, the coarser scale, and then we have this, the the, sorry, the opposite, where you see a course, it's coarser, and then it goes up. So the idea here is that um, these are the scales, and these are the offsets which represent all the different samples. If we used um, discrete wavelengths, we will not have such a uh, um, granular representation, okay? We would have um, a more, um, a, tree, a more tree-like structure, okay, in the discrete case. We need to be very, very granular in wavelength to capture in a, con in a concise enough way these features, okay? I won't go into detail why continuous, but, you know, we can talk about it. So the idea is that you can actually represent the, the wavelength decomposition of the signal, okay? So now we see that whenever there is a discontinuity, there is light up, the, uh, it's lighting up my uh, wavelet um, uh, coefficients, right? There is, there is no discontinuity, there is zero coefficients, there are large, the coefficients are large where there is discontinuity, okay? At different scales. Note that these persist uh, over different scales. That's the property of the wavelet we will see in a second. Okay, so what is the structure? First of all, the structure is sparse. Right? It's a sparse representation of the signal, which we know is good. We could have any spectrum of, of materials, but these guys, um, this representation is sparse in the sense that it right away concentrates you to the action. Okay? Then it has what we call persistence property. It's a property of the wavelet that if something is, is, is small, it tends to be small over, uh, at a wavelength, it tends to be small over different uh, scales, and the same thing um, if they're high, 
right? That's persistent. And then there's the clustering or decay, which is um, that these are concentrated. So those are all desirable property because we would like a representation in which um, the signal is represented by a concise um, representation that hopefully uh, zeroes in those diagnostic features. Remember, that's our goal. We want, we want that. Okay, so on top of the feature vectors, what we want to do is to have a statistical representation of those. We want to represent this, the different spectra as a family of random signals in which the, the wavelet coefficients are related statistically. How? By a hidden Markov chain. Non-homogeneous hidden Markov chain. We don't have time to go to in detail what a, uh, a non-homogeneous hidden Markov chain is, but the idea is that I have observations which are my wavelet coefficients. We assume that these wavelet coefficients are generated by a statistical model which is a Markov chain of st hidden states. If you've studied the hidden Markov models, you should know what I'm talking about. So there is a, that is used to encode the relationship between the coefficients. And uh, for each, um, these states can assume two values, a low value and a high value. That's in order to encode the fact that the sparsity problem. There's only a few large coefficients and many small coefficients. So these two states uh, encode that occurrence, right? I have two probability distributions, one for the large coefficients and one for the small coefficients. That distribution, um, uh, so for each value of the state, we have a Gaussian distribution. And this is what you get. Basically, that's the, you know, the distribution for the, low, the, uh, the, high, the, the high state, and this is the low state, okay? Actually, you, if, depending on the data, you can model each one of those distributions with multiple Gaussians. Actually, that's what we actually do. We, we use multiple Gaussian for the high state because it turns out that there is longer tail in that distribution. But this is basically the idea. We use this model to uh, link probabilistically the, the, the the wavelet coefficients uh, at, each wave, uh, at each wavelength for all scales to mimic the persistence and the clustering property of the wavelet coefficient. So what happens when we do that? That's what I, I just said. Now, once we have a model that um, I them, we can train that model and uh, as, uh, once you train that model, you get parameters, which are the probability of the states and the um, parameters of those Gaussians. We take the probability of those states and we use Viterbi algorithm to find the most likely set of states that generated a certain observation. So if this is a wavelet observation, we will use Viterbi to find the label set that most likely generated that observation, that's our feature. We will use that feature to do whatever we need to do, a mixing, classification. This is, this is a universal model in the sense that we came up with, prof, um, my colleague uh, Marco Duarte and I, we came up with it to encode basically, to have a set of features that would represent hyperspectral signals in classification and mixing anything. So the idea is that we hope that these, these binary features that says just this, for this signal, this feature is high, uh, likely high, and this is low. Um, this binary feature will be enough to represent the signal in classification and mixing. And in this case, we use it in a mixing, okay? They are relevant to the problem, no matter what the problem is. And they are interesting in the sense that they encode the semantics of the problem. So let's see. We do want to use it in a, in a mixing, OK? So we know what the problem is, right? We know that we want a mixing. Can we do it in this feature space? Can we do a mixing using these features? So we have to find some, some, kind, of, some kind of way to either relate the features 
the, the binary features of this model, of the, mi the mixed pixels with the binary features of the M members, or to find um, a way to do a, a mixing problem in that feature space. We, 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 we try to do that, okay? We take the mixing problem and divide it into detection problems. We say for this mixture problem, mixed mixture spectrum, is mineral A present or not? Is mineral B present or not? So we, we change the a mixing problem into a set of detection problem, into a set of classif binary classification problems, okay? And then we will um, say that our a mixing performance will be the average performance of these binary classifiers. Is that clear? Okay. So this is the algorithm. The algorithm, what it does, it takes spectra either from an image, but uh, in this case from either measurements of um, pure minerals at different grain sizes in different conditions. These are all these spectra, okay? Then what it, we, we create the, the features. Now, blue is b black and uh, white is, is red in this case, okay? We take the probability uh, that comes from what the probability of high. In each, uh, we calculate the number of, you know, the average of these features, basically. The, how, what is the probability of having a high label for each value here? We threshold that with the threshold. That, in the, in, we get basically another binary uh, matrix out of that. Now, we do the same exact thing, right? for all the other um, classes. This is the class, imagine that we're trying to do classifier A versus non-A. This is the class for A. All the others we pull together in the non-A class and we do exactly the same. Now here, we also threshold with another threshold. Now this is where we select features. We select the features, we remove the features that are high in both. These are our, the final features that we use. So here, the, this feature selection approach is done to remove false alarms. Because we know that there are set, and that's, that's what remove coherence, right? It removes, in feature space, the features that would be high because all classes have discontinuity in that point. So these features are really discontinuity that are present in that mineral and only that mineral. Okay, there could be more clever approaches here to use more information and that would be good actually, but that's for the future, okay? The idea here is that I'm trying to remove the effect of other classes so that these features will be more discriminative. We, um, the experimental setup is that we have all these mixtures. Um, we use several ternary mixtures of several um, M members and then we're trying to do the mixing of all of these mixtures by um, changing the mixing problem into a binary, into several binary classifiers, okay? So if we have one ternary mixture, we have to do three binary classifiers to figure out if each point has, um, per point, right? Uh, figure out if, if uh, there is enough, if uh, that point is a, has, has M members A, B, or C, okay? Or all of them. We compare with the linear, um, with one of those state-of-the-art sparse algorithms for a mixing, and we compare it into those Hopkin mixtures. Remember before? We make mixtures that are actually physical mixtures modeled with the Hapke model. Those, if you look geometrically, those represent um, mixtures that are nonlinear, but the nonlinearity is not too pronounced. This is a linear algorithm should do very well in this data set, okay? And then our evaluation is actually recall, uh, precision and recall, and our optimum is, so false positive divided by false positive plus uh, true negative, uh, recall is true positive divided by true positive plus false negative. So one is really affected by false alarms, the other one is um, by uh, detections. So these are the results. Um, this is the one that does the best. We tried an N 
um, and k, k nearest neighbor classifier, we try a linear SVM. Um, and this is the algorithm that we use to do the feature selection. We compare to other feature selection methods, uh, purely statistical feature selection method, which is an entropy base right there. And we try with this linear geometrical sparse based compressive sensing based classifiers. This optimum is close to the corner 1-1 one, one in the rock curve of our classifier. So this outperforms this. So the recall is slightly higher for this guy, but this really has a lot of false alarms. And so overall, the performance is better. This, all these mixtures, Hapke mixtures, are not very nonlinear. So this is a good case. We can prove that if the nonlinearity is more, con is more pronounced, this algorithm outperforms this with an order of magnitude, OK? But I don't have the data for it, because I wanted to show you that we are applying it to actually physical data. These, um, the no, the nonlinearity I had to create ad hoc. Uh, it's actually a toy example, so it wasn't physical. But trust me, on the nonlinear, uh, in on more nonlinear case, that algorithm works much better. But now the question is, okay, these features can be used to do a mixing, but can they be diagnostic? So we don't have a study that that actually. Uh, does it numerically, like quantitatively assess that, but, but qualitatively, the features, we are light up um, more in the regions that are diagnostic for those spectra. So if, if a scientist actually looks at our features, he says, yeah, you get discontinuities that are uh, that your statistical model is selecting discontinuities among all of the discontinuities in the signal that help you differentiate the spectra because these are diagnostic for that mineral. These are diagnostic. Even imagine, even the doublet here. Right, not the whole feature, just the doublet. Here, see the two lines here. And same thing with broader, um, with broader spectra, okay? So qualitatively, we have semantic, uh, achieve semantic uh, di diagnostic information. OK, so we said half an hour now. I, I, I can do 20 minutes. So, so now, if you're not dead, um, <laughs> my last, I promise, my last thing. Um, actually, the first work was um, joint work with my student, Yuki Ito. Um, this one is joint work with my other, my other, one other student of mine, uh, Arun Saranathan, um, Japanese Indian. Uh, and it's a Mexican. I don't know a Mexican. Uh, <coughs> this is where instead, we tr instead of considering those Hapke mixtures, those mixtures, uh, physical mixtures, right, the mo modeled by the Hapke model, right, as statistical. Elem, uh, statistical objects, I want to consider them as clouds in a geometrical sense, okay? But it's the same model, right? The same physical model. So the first thing that I want to convince you to is that if you consider a cloud that is generated by a Hapke model, a physical model, that cloud has a structure of a manifold. Sorry. I'll try to make it as straightforward as possible as straightforward as possible. So this is data that is generated according to two ternary mixtures with Hapke. The blue one is certain M members. The, set, the, the, the red one is other M members, but one of them is in common. So this is where the M member in common is, right? They overlap. See why I talked about adjacent manifolds? It's because they come together like in a fan, OK? Now, the. Um, uh, this is a toy example, but it's a representative of the type of data that um, we are dealing with, okay? So now, can we consider each one of these mixtures a manifold? It has a nonlinear structure, it has some kind of curve. As you can see, the curvature is not too big, right? Um, it just, you know, you see that the PCs, the, the third PC is not too, the range is not too big. Well. Actually, it can be done. It actually, 
can be seen as a manifold. Remember, what happens is that you have a feature, you have a, a nonlinear function of a single scattering albedo of the mixture, but that single scattering albedo of the mixtures is a simplex, which is a transformation of the abundant simplex. So the structure of a manifold is right there. If I sample a, a probability simplex of abundances, then in order to calculate the simplex of the M members, these are the M members, I, all I have to do is to do an affine transformation. That's the relationship between the, the, the abundant simplex and the affine. If you don't see it, don't worry. There is, you know, this is just to say that the single scaling albedo of the mixtures is, an is a, a convex combination of the single scaling albedos of the, of the M members, right? That's a way to represent it geometrically. Now, you have in a f once you're here, you have a function that once you fix the angles and the parameters, um, uh, once you fix the angles, it just takes this tri tri triangle and warps, uh, warps it. According to what? Warps it according to this function. This is the relationship between x and, and w. So that's the function that warps the triangle. So between here and here, this function is differentiable. Its inverse is differentiable. This, from an op open set from here to here, that is a manifold. OK? It's actually a simple manifold if you know differential geometry. OK? What happens if I change the angle? A mess. Because for each set of angles, you will have a different thing like that. You can still use it. A manifold structure is much more difficult, though. Uh, we won't go into the detail. You can, um, you can talk about manifolds in that sense, too. Um, uh, but now, so now that I've recognized that really each mixture has a structure uh, of a manifold, can I actually uh, mix several of these that come together, for example, like those two, right? Can I unmix? Can I find? And what does it mean to unmix those mixtures? It means recognizing each sample to be in what, what mixture, right? That's called clustering, right? I have to say, this pixel is really from the red, and that pixel is from the blue. Remember, that's, that's, we know that that's the case. The cloud that we're actually getting doesn't have the labels, right? It's all unsupervised. So our mixing problem is to get a cloud like that with no labels and figuring out first the labels, and then we want to do what we call the embedding. And the embedding, all there is, all it is, is to go from here back to there. Right? Kind of unwarp, finding basically the inverse of that. In some cases, the inverse is actually analytical, and you can directly calculate it. Most of the time, you can't. So that's why you need money for learning for it. So, uh, so the problem then of a mixing multiple mixtures with uh, uh, shared M members become the problem of joint manifold embedding and clustering. This is not very. This is not done in the literature. There's only a handful of algorithms that claim they do both embedding and clustering. And the reason is that you have different proper, different, generally manifold learning, which is, manifold learning is really just the embedding. You want to learn from the, what we call the embedded manifold, which is the work triangle. You want to learn b back what, um, the abundance simplex, which was what generated that manifold. You want to invert that function. Um, that's the embedding. And, 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 and the algorithms just do the embedding or just do the clustering. There's only a few that do both. And the reason is, is because generally, you, uh, in order to do the embedding, you assume some kind of graphical structure. You assume a graph on these uh, points. And the property of this graph has to have to be in a certain way for clustering and in another way for embedding. So they're, they're, the, the, the property of, of the graph 
are a, a trade-off. You can do, it's not easy to do both, okay? So you need uh, algorithms. So, again, I don't have time to explain all of these algorithms. These algorithms try to resolve the clustering and embedding in different ways. This does a low rank representation of, so it, it says each point is a linear, is a, is a linear combination of all the other points um, in, the, in the cloud, right? Uh, provided that there is a, a, a low rank constraint. This says um, I want linear combination in the cloud, but I only want point, a smallest number of sparse um, representation or the smallest number of points around each point. This one instead tries to really understand the structure of each manifold, okay? So this tries to create a graph that takes into account both the clustering and the embedding. And it says, if I have two manifolds, oh, come on. If I have two manifolds that come together, uh, why did I use the, this toy example instead of the, the one before? Because the one before, it's easier. This is a more complicated, the curvature is more, is more pronounced, and the um, intersection is more nonlinear. And so um, it's a more, it's a, you know, I, I try to complicate my life because I'm trying to submit this to machine learning conferences. <laughs> so <laughs> you need a more difficult example. So this is the case, right? Um, they come together, right? Um, first of all, LRE, which is uh, the low rank representation, fails as whenever the cloud is not centered in the origin. So it can deal with the fine spaces for a reason that I can't explain. Like, um, it, it, it considers linear combinations only and therefore can deal with a fine combination which will rep would be represented by a cloud that is not centered at zero. Also, um, when, 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 the, when the two manifolds are not independent, in, um, uh, it has problems. And in fact, if you look at the classification effect, it does completely the wrong thing, okay? Now, this guy also has problems um, in the sense that some of the intersection is not good. But overall, this is much better. And the reason is that it tries to constrain the neighbors that it's using to do the classification as much as possible. It's using very few neighbors to describe each point. It's saying, if I'm at the intersection, I can find a neighborhood in which only points from the same manifold are considered. But I pay by only using very small number of points. Here, you would need more points to clearly embed the manifold. And so that's what it's, when it's suffering in the, um, in the embedding, okay? That's the embedding. Um, those are warped squares. So the, what you should find once you do the embedding is two squares, two rectangles. Do, do they look like rectangles to you? Not really. So if you do well clustering, you don't do well embedding. If you try to push more the embedding, more, sam more low rank representation with more um, neighbors, you miss the classification. So how do you deal with it then? Uh, I'm not gonna even comment on that one. Uh, it's completely random. Um, so, well, the map, uh, let me spend just a second on it. Um, the way these algorithms do, these algorithms do, these algorithms, that this LRE algorithm does the classification. It tries to find a, it tries to minimize that function, x minus xr. x is your data. r is the old linear combination of your data. Okay? Subject to a constraint on the rank of the matrix R. When you do that, you get a block diagonal matrix R. That block diagonality enforces some kind of a clustering. Right? If those blocks are corresponding to the two manifolds, you're good, you're golden. 
Okay? So you're hoping that that is actually um, that only that plus lambda, the, the, the nuclear norm, you know, and uh, not, not exactly the rank, but the nuclear norm, is going to give you uh, the right clustering. Well, then they use spectral clustering to actually finish the job. Okay? Uh, the problem is that, first of all, when you're not on the center, you're not going to be able to do it. If you have to be exactly in the center. Because these are linear combination and not affine. That's the main problem that LRE has. Okay? The, the, the most important problem. Okay? Also, uses all the points and not neighbors. So when there's big nonlinearities, the embedding is not going to be good. Okay? So what we propose is we say, no, you cannot just use a few samples because we want a lot of samples in flat areas of the embedding for, to do a good embedding. So we don't want to use just a few because of the, uh, to do a better clustering. Okay? So we say, okay, let's do something like LRE, but with an R which is only based on a graph which is neighbor, neighborhood based. So that takes care of the highest nonlinearity. But then we use affine combinations right there. That's, that means that I don't use linear combination, but affine combination. Forget about the math. Uh, that actually enforces affine combination. It means that each point in each manifold can be affine combination of each point, uh, right? So if you have the two um, planes that are actually here and not at the origin, you're good. And that is actually spectral clustering. I won't prove it to you, but that, um, if you assume that R is positive, meaning that you, for example, in the first orthant or, um, or in an orthant in general, that corresponds to doing the spectral clustering over the matrix R. So you do everything in one. Now, your embedding is based on type LLE, if you know what spectral um, type of uh, you know, uh, manifold learning. It's just based on the na your neighborhood. That's the embedding. The clustering is based on spectral clustering directly there. And you ass assume um, a fine combination. Okay? This become, these are a bunch of non-negative uh, non uh, non matrix factorization. That's where you get that. Forget about that. How do we do? Well, it turns out we could do better, but we do better than state of the art. So the classification is actually very good. And I have other examples with different nonlinearities and things like that. How is the embedding? Well, the embedding, we find the corners, which is very good in a mixing. We want to recognize the corners. The overall structure is not exactly a rectangle. What happens is that what you really want to do, and I'm not going to explain it, um, what you really want to do, oh, come on. These are convex combinations of R. That tends actually to make uh, the periphery a little curved, more curved than you would like. So what you want is to not consider R positive and put an absolute value there, and that's what we're doing. Okay, that should improve. The last thing comes when the manifold is not well sampled. What do you do? Can use these guys, you have to do some kind of, uh, a take, it, take into account that the manifold is not well sampled. Um, and that's where the future work is. So, I hope there's good food because I think I killed you. <laughs> All right, that's it.